Welcome to this week's episode of the program. This is The Gavel. I am Benny Ark. The frequent amendment of the Constitution has become a customary undertaking for every legislative assembly. In the current context, it takes on added importance, demanding immediate and thorough consideration, especially in the light of the present economic and security challenges facing the nation. Let's take a look at the report. The amendment of the Constitution has become a regular process for every Assembly. It is even more pertinent now and requires urgent and detailed attention, considering the economic and security concerns across the country. The 10th Senate in February constituted a 45-member committee to review and amend the 1999 Constitution eight months after its inception. The Senate President, Gotu Lapabio, while announcing the composition of the committee during plenary, highlighted, amongst other things, the introduction of artificial intelligence as a major factor needed to amend the Constitution. There is need for us to touch on some aspects of the Constitution uh, to bring them in line with current realities, particularly with the era of artificial intelligence. We are taking one senator per state, because we are talking about a constitutional amendment. One senator per state, and then we are also taking one senator representing each geopolitical zone. Similarly, the House Committee on Constitution Amendment has held its inaugural meeting days after it was formed. The Deputy Speaker of the House, Honorable Benjamin Kalu, who is the chairman of the committee, called the attention to the number of bills received so far. The twin challenge of insecurity and economic difficulties could tamper with the confidence of our citizens. It is therefore our constitutional responsibility. The House of Representatives commenced the constitutional amendment process with a debate on a bill to introduce state policing. State police has been a subject of controversy since the Seventh Assembly and has failed to make it through the amendment phase. This time, it enjoyed more support from lawmakers. Amending the constitution to allow the state for state policing is not only a step towards true federalism, but also an acknowledgement of the diverse security challenges that vary from state, one state to another. Mr. Speaker, today, the UN density for police is four to one. We have a population of 200 million people, and the number of our policemen are under 400,000. It is appalling indeed. So many states we have security outfits. When they come out in their uniform, it gives impetus to the communities. Concerns about how state governors will take advantage of a policing system under their control is still rife among some members, especially as they reflect on existing security outfits in some states and regions. Many states, Mr. Speaker, do not even qualify to be states as it's today, economically. Many states may need to be marched, let alone to be saddled with the issue of state police. Mr. Speaker, honor members, as of today, we are a living witness, the federal government is battling on how to fund 300 or 400,000 police force in this country. Regardless, the bill skills second reading. A look back at the Constitution Amendment process carried out by the Ninth Assembly shows a climax in March 2022 the when the Senate is, and the House of Representatives voted on 68 Constitution Amendment bills. Some of the bills centered on issues which have captured public interest over the years. The Constitution Amendment bills eventually passed by the Ninth Assembly include Local Government Financial Autonomy passed. Financial independence of state houses of assembly and state judiciary passed. To move airports from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list passed. To allow states to generate, transmit and distribute electricity in areas not covered by the national grid passed. To move railway from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list passed. 
independent candidacy in elections passed. But Parliament failed to amend all the constitutional gender bills before it, an action which infuriated gender rights activists erupting in days of protest at the National Assembly. Bill to expand the scope of citizenship by registration. Bill expanding indigenship rights. Bill to create special seats for women in national and state houses of assembly. Bill to ensure early submission of names of nominees for ministers and commissioners. 35% affirmative action for women in political party administration. The 9th National Assembly's attempt to amend the 1999 constitution was almost considered an exercise in fertility. Following statements by the Senate President and the Speaker of the House of Representatives accusing state assemblies of stalling the process. The former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Femi Bajabiamila, had said the 9th National Assembly might not be able to complete the ongoing amendment process before the expiration of its term. He spoke in Abuja at the Distinguished Parliamentarian's Lecture 2022 organized by the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. The former president of the Senate, Dr. Ahmed Lawan, on his part, urged the governor of Kaduna State, Nasser El Rufai, to prevail on his colleagues to encourage their respective houses of assembly to support local government autonomy and promptly transmit back to the National Assembly their responses on the bills sent to them on constitution amendment. Several of the commitments in the legislative agenda require amendments to the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to achieve them. If you took a poll in this room now about the importance and need for substantive reforms to our nation's constitution, I am sure the poll would return an overwhelming majority in favor. The National Assembly passed a raft of amendments to the Constitution and advance them to the states as required. That process now seems to have stalled in the state assemblies. As it is today, it is doubtful that the current constitutional amendment effort will conclude before the expression of the legislative arm, uh, the legislative term. I pray it does. We want it to, because the amendments are far-reaching. But the National Assembly right now is functional official. So we're done. We've moved the ball to the state assemblies. And I'm glad that the Senate President did appeal to Governor El Rufai to talk to his colleagues for us to quickly advance our course of democracy and return these far reaching amendments which we painstakingly, as a House and as a Senate, put together for the good governance of Nigeria. Despite broad national agreement on the need for reform, the potential for achievement can rise or fall based on differences in the expectations of the context, pace, and direction of the specific proposals. Two other challenging areas are that the legislative agenda of the House is a policy document. A statement of intent and an articulation of shared priorities. It is not a rule book. There are no mechanisms in it or elsewhere to compel legislative action, even within the House of Representatives. This is why we need to develop a system to drive its implementation through policy innovation and monitoring unit, which I said earlier that I set up in the office of the speaker. And through the special committee on monitoring and implementation of the legislative agenda. By January 2023, 35 constitutional alteration bills had been considered by 27 state houses of assembly and approved by at least 24 state assemblies as required by section 9 of the constitution. The state assemblies, however, failed to vote on the two bills that sold financial and legislative autonomy for local governments. By March 2023, 
the then President Muhammad Buhari signed 16 of the 35 Constitution Amendment Bills transmitted to him, some of which are the Bill on Financial Independence of State Houses of Assembly and State Judiciary, the removal of the railway, prison and electricity from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent list. The bill to alter the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, to delete the reference to the provisions of the Criminal Code, the Penal Code, Criminal Procedure Act, Criminal Procedure Code or Evidence Act. The bill to alter the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to allow states to generate, transmit and distribute electricity in areas covered by the national grid. The bill to alter the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 to require the President and Governors to submit the names of persons nominated as Ministers or Commissioners within 60 days of taking the oath of office for confirmation by the Senate or State House of Assembly and for related matters. Those rejected by former President Buhari include... The bill to alter the second schedule of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to empower the National Assembly and State Houses of Assembly to summon the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Governors of States to answer questions on issues on which the National and State Houses of Assembly have powers to make. The fifth alteration bill number 30, which sought for an act to alter the provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to include former heads of the National Assembly and the Council of State. The bill to alter the provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to specify the period within which the President or Governors of States shall present the appropriation bill before the National Assembly or House of Assembly, amongst others. Several members of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in the House of Representatives have voiced their call for the immediate resignation of the National Chairman, Umar Damagum. They allege that his actions and allegiances have been in favor of the All Progressive Congress, APC, raising serious concerns within the party's ranks. This is the report. Some PDP lawmakers in the House of Representatives are calling for the resignation of the National Chairman, Umar Damagum, while accusing him of working for the APC. Led by Honorable Ikenga Ogochinyari, the lawmakers question why the party leadership has stayed silent on the reverse political situation and instead watched the president intervene. They say the local government leadership of the party must not be extended. According to the lawmakers, under Damagum, the PDP has been crumbling, losing elections and court cases. That role which Nigerians would have loved the PDP to play as an institution, it truly, it truly is, has been abandoned for a plate of porridge. A serious leadership would have set up structures to review what, why and how the party failed to win the last presidential election, and also failed to secure majority in both chambers of National Assembly. Rather, the old Madame Agun led NWC is working to hand over the party to the ruling APC and their agents. There have been agreements of a broad spectrum of the party leadership. When it became clear that Damagu was not interested in conducting an election, but to appoint Kiatika committee in at least 90 states, where the tenure of the state and local government leaders were expiring, to extend the tenure of these officials by three months. Presently, in all the states where PDP is not the governor, Damagu has already concluded arrangement to hand the party leadership to APC. In the specific case of River State, the Kiatika committee members from Damagun's office are LUGA chairmen produced by former River State House of Assembly members who, as we all know, have lost their seats following their defection to APC. They have formally left the PDP and Damagun is taking a list from them to announce. The Chairman House Committee on Tertiary Education and Students' Loan, Honorable Gwe Gaishiaka, says the exemption of private universities from the students' loan scheme was due to their high cost of fees. Honorable Ishiaka stated this while briefing journalists on the bill signed into law by the President on Wednesday. He further highlights that the amended law now provides that while the stringent measures contained in the previous bills have been expunged, the loan status of individuals who obtain the student's loans must be checked by any employer before granting employment to such an individual. For anybody that has the capacity to send uh, his or her children or his or her, you know, his children to schools where, to some of those private schools, 
you you will agree with me that the need for a loan of this scheme is probably minimal. I know that thoughts are on to see what can be developed for the private for private. You know, the provision of private may not be exactly what is in the you know in public. You know, because I mean, if you are talking of truth, if you want to fund the school fees of private of a private student, one private student, school student, you probably fund about hundred of a public of, of a public school, and we want this, we want to give this to a larger number of people. We now have a law that is not talking about discrimination in terms of the, who, who you know who gets what. Um, you know, uh, the other law says that unless your parents, I mean, if your parents have you know combined revenue of five hundred thousand naira, you are not going to be able to enter to the law. All those, all those have been removed. The House Committee on Population last week commenced its investigation into the 200 billion naira sofa spent on the suspended 2023 population and housing census. Chairman of the committee during its inaugural sitting said the committee will right the wrongs concerning petitions laid by individuals and groups. This committee is here to right every wrong concerning all petitions laid and every motion moved by some individual group of persons, civil society and some members of the parliament demanding to know how the money was expended in the 2023 postponed population and housing census. It may interest you to know that the leadership of the committee has been working tirelessly to make sure this population and housing census is a reality this year. Petition and motion not, notwithstanding. This committee is here to, to, to level every rough ground and come out with the best census so far in the history of our great nations. Today on Consistency Focus, we're engaged in a conversation with Honorable Francis Waive, who represents the Ugeli North South Udu Federal Constituency of Delta State. He shared insights into its vision, initiatives, and success stories aimed at serving and improving the lives of his constituents. This is the interview. My people of Ugele North, Ugele South, and Udu uh, are in their need of federal presence in the constituency. And uh, that is why they sent me here. I understand what they need, and that is exactly what I've been facing, trying to ensure that they get in the last five years, and then again in the next three years, still remaining in my mandate. Three years plus, of course, and perhaps who knows what God has thereafter. And federal presence, why do we need it in our constituency? My constituency is one of the highest oil-producing, gas-producing uh, 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 constituency in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In fact, the gas plant at Otorugu is a testimony to that. And the hundreds of oil wells and the tens of uh, uh, oil prospecting companies in our uh, locality uh, prove to that. And I'm grateful to God for the opportunity uh, to serve very educated people, very enlightened people, millions of people, and they've chosen me to speak for them here. It is something that I am thrilled about. And my first priority here is to ensure that laws are made that are favorable to my people, laws of our country. So where there is need for amendment, and where there is need for uh, fresh legislation. I'm glad to say that in my first tenure, I did uh, nearly 40 bills. In fact, the other paper uh, uh, nominated me as, one of, as a semi-finalist among one of those who scored uh, the highest number of bills in the Ninth Assembly. And not just the highest number, quality bills also. Establishment bills, amendment bills, and fresh bills that I did propose. And in this second tenor, I have also proposed over 10 bills. Uh, constitutional reforms, electoral reforms, and uh, uh, criminal code amendment. All of them are in the public uh, uh, domain. Another tool I'm using to serve my people while here is the issue of ensuring that the infrastructure, our infrastructural needs are captured by the federal budget. And that is the beauty of having somebody come again. He, he knows the nitty gritty of what to do and how to do it. In my first tenure, over 15 schools uh, primary and secondary had intervention in terms of uh, new classroom blocks, renovation, 
over 15 communities had solar street lights and, and uh, over 15 also got uh, transformers. Many areas in which we intervened uh, for the benefit of our people. We tarred roads and we did so many things that, that simply shocked people. We, we changed the narrative and people began to ask that we do it again. In fact, that is why I am happy to be here again to do it for my people. So many things that we did, notebooks for children in secondary and primary schools, uh, you name it, the things that we do, cash empowerments to uh, 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 constituents. You talk about uh, um, the loans that were in vogue at that time, uh, and we were able to make sure um, um, uh, constituents were able to assess them. The COVID grants, hundreds of our people were able to assess due to the effort of the Honorable Member representing the people of Ugele North, Ugele South, to do the Reverend Francis A. Jurog and wife. It's my pleasure to serve my people, and uh, so much that we did. Communities that were not connected to the uh, national grid we were able to connect over 20 in just the space of four years. And I am so thrilled that many of them uh, got back electricity and are now enjoying uh, national grid, power from the national grid. I can go on and on to mention things that uh, we have done while we are here. So representation is a key function of the uh, 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 legislator. We speak for our people. It has been my pleasure to present petitions on behalf of my people on the floor of the House and to speak for them when motions and bills have been uh, debated so that the voice of my people has been here. When I was campaigning, I told my people that I'll be present on the floor and I'll speak, they'll hear my voice. And I'm glad that I'm able to do that and they can testify that the people of Ugele North, Ugele South and Udu, have, uh, their voice has been heard here clear, strong, and uh, uh, directly. So, lawmaking, representation, and then the oversight functions that uh, a lawmaker has to perform. I've done that very well. In fact, that's what I'm able to attract the, uh, what I'm able to attract uh, to my people. And the future looks even brighter. I'm going to do more for my people, especially now that I'm an experienced member, a ranking member of the House of Representatives. They can be sure of more dividends of democracy. Uh, if they look at the, the budgets as they roll by year after year, they will see that the names of our communities in our constituency are well spelled. And that the projects are executed and our people, they get the benefit and have a sense of belonging to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That concludes our program for this week. Your feedback is valued, so please don't hesitate to reach out via email at thegavel at channelstv.com. Thank you for joining us today. This is Benny Ark signing off. Take care and be well.